Uh, Mr. Turner. Good afternoon. This is a Facebook Live on News 9, News 1 6. Glad that you're here. And we're so appreciative of uh, Dr. Larry Bittman, the president of the Oklahoma State Medical Association, with us this afternoon. It's only been a couple of weeks since we had to here on Hot Seat. Scott, it's always good to be here with you. All right. Uh, the reason for today's event is that we are going to see a really large rally tomorrow at the state capitol by Together OK, and it's regarding coverage, health care coverage, and the debate that's happening at the state capitol over Oklahoma's uninsured uh, rates. Dr. Bookman, if you would, take us through what the problems are. We, we hear from the lobbyists, we hear from the trade groups, and we hear from the folks that want coverage, but health professionals, don't hear as much from health professionals about this. Tell us what the problem is. Well, first let me say that we don't use the word Medicaid expansion because Medicaid expansion is a formal program that has strings attached from the federal government. What the Oklahoma State Medical Association and myself as president want for this state is to maximize federal dollars. We want our federal tax dollars returned to Oklahoma to invest in our infrastructure, to decrease our uninsured, and to increase our access for all patients in Oklahoma. Right now it's important to understand we are the second highest state in the country for uninsured. Yet 80% of our uninsured have working members in their family. One in 10 children are uninsured in this state. 26,000 veterans who have served our country are uninsured. That's unacceptable rates. We have to change that. And to do that, we need federal dollars to increase the number of insured and to increase the access that they have. The Kaiser Foundation alone studied over 200 studies and concluded that if you decrease the uninsured rate, you increase access and you increase health outcomes. Oklahoma is at the bottom of the health status rankings. We've got to make a change, and federal dollars are necessary. That will improve the information health exchange that we have in this state. It will help the infrastructure that we need. It will greatly improve our rural hospitals. There's an economic development to obtaining federal dollars. If we improve the, the number of insured, it will increase the bottom line for most rural hospitals by two to three percent. That's enough to keep rural hospitals open, which means that physicians will stay in rural areas because they have a hospital to practice at. And each physician in a rural area is worth $1.9 million in economic benefit to that community. You have to understand that just yesterday, Metaflight stated that they will no longer serve Chickasha, Seminole, and several other communities because of the uninsured rates. That's vital to a rural hospital to be able to Metaflight sick patients or trauma patients to the medical centers so that they can get emergency care. We can't allow these things to happen. That's a lot to unpack. So let's start going down from the, from, the, from the top there. Medicaid expansion. I think that probably everybody understands by now that leadership have said, and I think we hear Leader Eccles say this pretty often, oftentimes on Sundays, we're not going to have, the governor has also expressed some concern about this, we're not going to have full-blown Medicaid expansion. So much that we joke about it, we, we don't even use it. It's like saying Voldemort, you don't say it. That's right. Medicaid expansion, you don't say it. So this rally to get full-blown Medicaid expansion is just not going to happen. It's not going to happen. But what you're saying is there are federal dollars that can come back into the state. So it's not a zero-sum game, right? You can have, you can have less than the full-blown Medicaid expansion and still do good work for the state. Absolutely. There are millions of dollars that we're leaving on the table through programs such as the high-tech program, which will help with opioids. Uh, there are other programs through grants and waivers 
that we can apply for, and the federal government is eager to grant the waivers so that we get federal money to improve our infrastructure, our access, our uninsured, all of that can be improved without the strings attached. The referendum that is being filed on April 24th, I've not had a chance to read. But as I understand it, it does not include a sunset clause which would allow the state to back out of any commitment if the federal government backs out of their matching funds. And that's important. You don't want to put the state at a financial risk when they couldn't afford it. Let's talk about patients. You said we are the second highest uninsured rate in the country. Correct. What is, uh, if a person's uninsured from a physician standpoint, what does that mean about that patient? From a physician standpoint, it doesn't make a difference. Physicians take an oath. We'll take care of any patient who needs health care. Obviously, it makes a difference on the bottom line of how we practice. When people talk about too few physicians, to get physicians to come to this state, we need a higher rate of insured patients. That's their economic base. If we have a higher rate of uninsured, we also have less ability for that patient to find access because, as I said, in the rural areas, there just aren't the number of providers, both nurse practitioners and physicians, because they're not being reimbursed. They can't make ends meet. If you're a patient and you're uninsured, what are some of the symptoms or some of the problems that you would have not having any access to uh, care? A very wise man has stated that the uninsured live sicker and die younger. That's a quote that needs to be remembered because we have patients, as a gastroenterologist, we have patients all the time who have not seen a physician for 10, 15, or even 20 years who have had problems, bleeding or abdominal pain, and have ignored them because they couldn't afford even an office visit because they were uninsured. That's not acceptable. When we take a look, we find serious disease. Kentucky is the first state that has put out a statewide research uh, program where they showed that within the first two years of accepting Medicaid expansion, they increased their number of colonoscopies by 230%. The number of people coming in for screening was increased. And most importantly, they increased by 130% the number of colon cancers that were caught early and had better outcomes. That's going to save money in the long run if those people aren't having to undergo adjuvant therapy with chemotherapy, with radiation therapy, with multiple surgeries. They're able to live full lives. So that's a definite result of Medicaid expansion. And that's what giving patients access, giving patients insurance, which allows them access, and giving them the rural hospitals and the physicians and the providers will do for our people in Oklahoma. It's my understanding that state medical does not have anything to do with the ballot aspect that's coming up, but you are with a lot of other groups and urging legislature to move forward with this. What is the feedback? You had medical day at the Capitol the other day. What is your feedback from, let's start with the majority party in terms of where they're at on this issue. I think right now the majority party wants and agrees that we need the federal dollars. I do not get the feeling that at this point in time, although attitudes have changed a lot over the last year, but I don't get the feeling that they want formal Medicaid expansion. They do want to work with the physicians of this state to try to improve our health outcomes. The governor has made it a major point that he wants to be a top 10 state in health and he has a group working on that but they're not ready for formal Medicaid expansion they want federal dollars through the waivers and and uh, grants as I talked about so I do think that there is some movement 
forward in getting more federal dollars, but not for formal Medicaid expansion at this time. Let's talk about the rural areas. You started off talking about the rural areas and about what it means for a small town to have a doctor. Just how bad is coverage in the rural areas in Oklahoma? Is it still in the bottom one or two in the country? It's in the bottom five anyway. Um, and that would include both the nurse practitioners, PAs, as well as physicians. We want to see a team-based approach for health care in this state. We want physicians overseeing the mid-levels in some form. Now that may include telehealth. Telemedicine is an important aspect of the future for medicine in rural states like Oklahoma. But yes, we have a drastic need for more physicians. The Oklahoma State Medical Association is proud to say that we partnered with Blue Cross to put a physician in Guyman, Oklahoma. We've now partnered with TSET to put a physician in southeastern Oklahoma in Idabel. So we are working to recruit and bring physicians in. But again, we need the ability to have insured patients for those physicians to do well. Give us an example of, you're a citizen of Guyman, if this project comes in, you've got a physician there. How does it change life for people in Guyman? Well, it changes it drastically. Uh, first of all, as I said, a physician in a small community is worth $1.9 million in economic benefit to that community. It allows the patients to get to know their physician and have it readily accessible. How would you like if you had acute chest pain and had to drive 30 minutes or an hour to see a physician? That's just not good health care. So having a physician in small communities allows those people to get to know their physician, to have that relationship that's necessary for good health care, but have it immediately accessible to them. The young physician in Guyman speaks five languages, so she can converse with her patients in their native language and provide good health care to them and if they need referral to a city, then she'll take care of that. Let's talk about some of the recurring issues we hear year after year after year after year. Smoking rates up, obesity up. Now these are issues long before Medicaid expansion, right? You're seeing these issues that are still on the table in front of us. What do we need to be doing about those? Well, first let me say that TSET, the Tobacco Settlement Endowment Trust, has done a very good job in decreasing smoking. We are now around 36th in the country where we were in the bottom five. So we've improved in our smoking. Where we are having problems now is in our teenagers in vaping. The e-cigarettes have taken off and are being promoted as they're healthy, they're safe, there's no problem. And that's not true. The carcinogens that come out from the combustible uh, products from vaping are just as dangerous and may be more dangerous. So now we're having to work on that problem. We now have marijuana. Marijuana was passed, as you well know, recently, and smoking of marijuana, again, has combustible products, and we know that they are carcinogens. We know that they can cause lung cancer. So people who have chronic recurrent use of marijuana by smoking are putting themselves at the same risk as cigarettes did. Obesity is a major problem in this state. Our obesity rate decreased or worsened by 17% from 2017 to 2018, one year. Why was that? Inactivity, we are 48th in the country in inactivity. We're a rural state. People should be out doing things, yet, especially among our young, uh, the video games, television, and just not being involved in outside activities has threatened to create a major problem with obesity in this state. Our eating habits, nutrition is a major problem. Eating of fried foods, fast foods, um, that's sort of the southern way, and Oklahoma is right. still a southern state. 
So, you know, from the biscuits and gravy to the bacon to everything else that we eat, it's all creating a problem with us with obesity. So if you add eating wrong and you add uh, inactivity, you end up with obesity. And if you're obese, your incidence of high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, and especially diabetes are all increased. And we're at the bottom of all of those. Our buddy TC up in Enya is going to be having some problems with the biscuits and gravy. He did a couple weeks ago when you talked about that. Well, anyway, so <laughs> uh, mental health, mental health issues, we still continue to talk about that. We still seem to be in the bottom. For physicians, how does that register with y'all? Well, we understand that that's a serious problem, and we do not have the resources that we need in mental health. Forty percent of our incarcerated patients have mental health problems. We need more money, and we're hoping to work with the OSU Health Science Center, who will be the recipient of our opioid um, settlement, uh, to try to set up programs that will help both uh, addiction as well as mental health problems. But we need, again, it's gonna take resources. It's gonna take money to set up the programs, but we need to improve our mental health status. One of the things that has Medicaid expansion over the past couple of administrations has been somewhat of a political football. You know that the previous governor accepted Medicaid expansion then, opted out of it. Most people thought there were political overtones to that. We've gone down near the bottom in many categories. There are a lot of Republicans, the majority party, who have said well, we're not for Medicaid expansion because it tied back to the O word. Uh -huh. We all know what that O word was? Yes, son. Obamacare, right? So you've got a new generation of lawmakers out there, many Republicans. You as a physician, and you're talking with these lawmakers that have come to town since the, Ob since the President Trump came to town, President Obama's two terms are up. What do you say to them to readjust their thinking about health care issues in Oklahoma and accepting these federal dollars from Washington. We have to accept the federal dollars in one form or another. I understand having certain restrictions, certain fail-safe provisions attached to that, but we have to get the federal dollars. We're paying federal taxes that are going to other states. We need to have that return to Oklahoma if we want to improve. Oklahoma as a state fell in 2017 from 43rd to 47th in the health rankings in 2018. The largest decline of any state in the union. We can't keep that trend up. We're, we only have two more slots to go. We can only be number 50. We've got to reverse it. If you look at in the 90s, we were in the 30s. So we've dropped at least 10 to 15 positions in health rankings in this country in the last 20 years. The reason being that the states that have accepted Medicaid expansion have all moved in front of us. We can't allow that. We need federal dollars. I think that we need to put party politics aside. Don't use the word Obamacare if you want. Use ACA or Affordable Care Act but we need the federal dollars. Oklahoma is in a health crisis, and OSMA, the State Medical Association, as well as the physicians of this state, have partnered with different coalitions to try to accomplish getting maximum federal dollars to this state. Well, Dr. Bookman, thanks for being here today. This is, tomorrow is the rally. I think it starts mid-morning, and they're gonna be talking about this issue. We all know the words Medicaid expansion is a lightning rod when it comes to politics. And if people want more, want to know more, they go to the OSMA website. Absolutely. You've got your policies, the things that you folks want to get done over there. Well, again, thanks for coming in on this rainy day. And if anybody has questions, call the Oklahoma State Medical Association. They can ask for me. I'll be glad to communicate with anybody who has questions. I think the bottom line for physicians in this state we have to improve our health outcomes. Dr. Larry Bookman, the new president of Oklahoma State Medical Thank Association. Thanks for joining us Facebook Live on News 9, News on 6. I'm Scott Mitchell. See you again this weekend. Learn more at MitchellTalks.com and follow me, Scott Mitchell, on Twitter at MitchellTalks.